So we have seven papers in the session and now you know how it works. So as usual, we will have all seven presentation and then we will have the question at the end of the session. So, and of course, you know now how it works, but uh, just ask your question in the Zulip chat. So we start with two papers on variants of snow. The first one is a presentation of a new design, which is called Snow V, and as a presentation is given by Patrick Ekdal. Patrick, you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, yes, um, this is a joint work then with Thomas Johansson, Alexander Maximov, and Ying Yang. <coughs> and me and Alexander are from Ericsson Research, and Thomas and Ying is from uh, Lund University. So this, uh, as the title suggests, is a new stream cipher that we are proposing. And the background for, for this work is, is really the, the error encryption uh, algorithms used in the cellular networks, uh, in, in 4G specifically. Um, the, the algorithms that are protecting their link in 4G has also been adapted to 5G. And uh, there are three core 128 algorithms specified there. And, and uh, the first one is based on Snow 3G. The second one is based on AES. And the third one is based on SOOC. Um, and but so these were just sort of transferred from 4G to 5G um, when the, the specification work started. But as the evolution of 5G has, has sort of go on, uh, we see that there are um, some new properties that 5G will bring that, that affects the error encryption algorithms. Um, and the, the, the first and most, I think, most important uh, one is the virtualization of the mobile network nodes. So uh, <clears throat> this means that, that many of the nodes used in, in the core network, but also in the radio access network, those nodes that are closest to the radio unit, they will, uh, in the future, we think, be, be virtualized. And, and they are indeed specified to being able to be virtualized. Uh, so this means that the uh, the uh, encryption termination on the base station or the network side uh, must be able to run Sorry, in a Patrick, virtualized the, environment. The sound so, is quite bad. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's better it's maybe bad. if it comes from your ah, connection, yeah. maybe it's better if you try to turn off your camera. Ah, it could be. Know. Turn off my what? Maybe if you Sorry? stop the video, the sound will be better if it comes from the connection. Ah, right. good. I will stop the video. So is it is it better now? No, it's not. Do you think it's better now? No. It's not. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah so maybe. It's, uh... No, it's not really. It's not really better. It's, uh, I don't know why that is. <laughs> Could it be the speakers? Let's try. That yeah, could be. The speakers instead. Somehow about this? Does yeah, it it's better. better. Yes, yes, it's much better. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Good. No problem. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, so um, as I said, the, the virtualization property. Um, so the the algorithms need to be really fast in in both hardware, but also in software in a pure sort of uh, COTS environment. Um, and also, 3DPP, which is standardization organization, has started to, to look at 256-bit algorithms. And the third property that is important is the speed, which they, uh, the anticipated downlink speed is around 20 gigabits per second and, and even might be faster. So um, in this light, we decided to develop this new algorithm, which is sort of a refactored version of four parallel copies of Snow 3G. Uh, in, a, in order to be able to meet these uh, three new properties. So here, it's, uh, here is what it looks like. Uh, it's, it's, as I said, built on the same principles. We have the, the linear feedback shift register construction at the top. Um, and at the bottom, we have a finite state machine. Um, what is, so we have increased uh, the number of state bits up to 896. And also each 
output from the stream cipher is now 128-bit um, words, which gives us, of course, a much faster speed. And the whole design is, is used, <coughs> is, is um, designed to be using uh, vector instructions like AVX and NEON, etc. And also, it's uh, the S boxes in the FSM is constructed around a full AES round function. Uh, and as you know, we have accelerated instructions in most CPUs for that operation. So that means that it can be really fast. So if we look uh, more specifically at the, um, the linear shift register part, uh, we have two LFSRs uh, of size 16 times 16 bits. Uh, but it's uh, sort of a, a novel circular construction so that the output from LFS, uh, LFS a, LFSRA is shifted back into the input of B and vice versa, the B output is shifted back into A. Um, and we have in the paper a proof of the, the uh, periodicity of this construction to be maximum. Um, and also, uh, at each update of the cipher, we, we clock these LFSR eight times. So that means that the tap bits coming out of, uh, if you look at the picture, B8 to B15 and A0 to A7, um, they are fresh for each new clocking. And this construction is, is uh, done in this particular way because it can be very suitable to implement the software using these uh, vector instructions. If we look at the finite state machine, uh, we have those tap values T1 and T2 coming into this machine, and the output is then given by um, uh, the register R1, which the, you have three registers, R1 to R3, that, that are 128 bit wide. And then we have uh, the value of R1, added to this tap value and then that XOR to R2 value. Now this addition here is uh, of course uh, 128 bits but the addition the carry is only carried for 32 bits so we have four different 32 bit carries in this addition. And then the uh, registers are, are updated through this AES um, round function which we basically use as a, a 128-bit wide S-box. So the, um, the, the keys, the round keys, are, are all set to zero. So we, we don't use them in, in, uh, in any way. We just use it as a permutation. And then we have also a, a new thing from, from um, uh, if you compare it to Snow 3D, we have this byte permutation sigma, uh, which turns out to be really, um, really good um, in, in, um, in mitigating some, some uh, linear attacks. Um, so in the initialization, it works as you would expect. You load the key and the IV value into the state register or the, the LFSRs. And um, also during this update, as you can see in the second uh, round rectangle here, we feed the output set into the uh, feedback loop of the shift registers as we go along. And we do this for this initialization rounds is, um, is uh, 16 rounds. Uh, we, we clock the, the construction. Uh, also in the uh, FSM, in the two last rounds of this initialization, we add the key um, to the update of the R1 register. And this um, sort of represents an instantiation of the FP1 mode introduced by Haman and Krauss uh, two years ago. Which, so basically you can't, even if you <coughs> obtain uh, some of the state, as a state at a certain point, you cannot sort of reverse it back to the, um, to find the keys. Uh, we also have defined an AAD mode for this cipher. Um, it's uh, similar to what's uh, used in the mobile ne network today. Uh, and we use the ghash function from, from GCM as the, the, the main part of the authentication. But uh, one, one major difference uh, from this scheme to GCM is, is that the key H is fresh for every key and IV pair in our case. So we, we generate that as one of the first outputs. 
and also we have um, a different initialization value uh, for the LFSR. But otherwise, it, it's pretty much the same as, as the DCM in, in terms of how it works. The dhash function is, is the same. If we look at the performance in software, um, one of the, the claims here was that it, it's a really fast ciphering software. And if you compare it to um, well, the implementations used in OpenSSL, the assembler optimized um, implementations there, compare it to, for instance, AES 256-bit uh, CTR mode, um, we see that we are 1.5, 1.6 uh, times faster, reaching about 68 gigabits per second for longer plain text. As you go down in plain text size, uh, we of course are going to be hit by this initialization phase that stream ciphers have. Uh, if we look at the AAD mode, Patrick, I guess we, we have to move to the compatible. conclusion. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a bit of a sound problem there also. We have the, the hardware, uh, which is also very good. It, it can do about 700, 700 gigabits per second in a hardware implementation. Uh, the security evaluation there is in the paper. We look at in the cessation attacks and linear attacks. Uh, and it, uh, this safer has also been evaluated by external independent experts in order to be considered for the standardization work in, in the mobile industry. So that's, um, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry about the sound problem that I had. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are now moving to a, another presentation of a second paper on a variant of SNOW. So this is now a cryptanalysis paper on SNOW Fuji. And the presentation is given by Jin Yang. Uh, hello, can, is yeah. it work? Yeah, it works. So you can start. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Jin Yang, and uh, I will give a short introduction to our work about the vectorized linear approximations for attacks on Snow 3G. So, Snow 3G is a uh, one confidentiality and integrity algorithm in 3G and LTE systems, which is used for a 128 bit security level. While for 5G, as Patrick just mentioned, 3GPP has suggested to use 256-bit case and the security algorithms to resist against the quantum computing. And thus, the security of existing algorithms under the 256-bit cadence should be carefully investigated to make sure that they can actually provide the 256-bit uh, security. And that is the motivation of our work. So in our paper, we have given linear cryptanalysis of Snow 3G. Specifically, we found a 24-bit linear approximation with bias to the power of minus 37. We then experimentally verified this bias by collecting a large number of samples. And with this linear approximation, we were being able to give a distinguished attack with complexity to the power of 172 and a correction attack with complexity to the power of 177. And these attacks show, indicate that Snow 3G cannot achieve the full 256-bit security. But we would like to mention that it's not an immediate threat for 5G since these attacks require a large number of data. Uh, the picture shows the structure of Snow 3G. It is a word-based swim cipher with the linear part, which is an Elfshar with 16 cells, and a non-linear part, uh, which is a finite state machine, FSM. The FSM has three registers, R1, R2, and R3, and the update is shown here. Here, S1 and S2 are two non-linear mappings from 32 bits to 32 bits. And the key stream block is also 32 bits. So we built a 24-bit linear approximation. So specifically, we built 24-bit variable symbols by combining the first bytes of every three consecutive key stream blocks, which is showing on the left side in the formula. So for the key stream block at clock t plus one, we apply a linear masking, which is the inverse of L1. Uh, for the expression on the right side, it can be divided into three parts. 
The last part is the linear part denoted as ST, while the first two parts are nonlinear denoted as N1T and N2T, and they are regarded as the noises. So if we approximate ZT as ST, the noise would be NT, and it would be the XOR sum of N1T and N2T. We computed the bias of this noise uh, using the squared Euclidean imbalance, which is to the power of minus 37. And it's well known that uh, around one over epsilon number of samples are needed to distinguish the noises from random. So we experimentally verified this bias. Since ZT equals ST XOR and T, if we XOR ZT and ST, the result would be NT and it would be biased. So we run many uh, snow 3G instances and connect many samples of ZT XOR in ST. And we further verify if these, these sample sequences follow the computed noise distribution or just a random distribution. Hypothesis testing according to the callback lateral divergence is used to help make the decision. And the results show that with around eight to 16 times one over epsilon number of samples, we can distinguish in the um, sample sequences. And this indicates that the bias we have got is correct. Uh, for the distinguish attack, we find a way for multiple to cancel out the LFJ contribution with complexity to the power of 172. Thus, the alpha contribution at these four time instances or any shifted clux of these time instances uh, is summed to be zero. And thus, we can build new biased key stream samples XG by XORing the ZT Z values at these four time instances. And the result would be the noises. The bias is larger than to the power of minus 163. And thus the data complexity is upper bounded by two to the power of uh, 163. For the correlation attack, a correlation attack is usually modeled as a decoding problem in the binary field or the binary extension field. So we build a new 8-bit approximation by XORing each byte of the noise we have just got, but we use two linear maskings lambda and gamma applied to the first and the last byte of the noise. And the best gamma, lambda and gamma gives us the best bias to the power of minus uh, 41. And we then use a method from uh, the paper of Bin Zhang in crypto 2015 for the decoding, which requires complexity to the power of 177. So that ends my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we can now move on to another stream cipher. And so the next uh, presentation is given by Alexander Maximov and it's entitled Spectral Analysis of Zook 256. Does it work? Hello? Yes. Okay, great. So I will try to be very short. So this work was done together with uh, Ying Yang and Thomas Johansson from uh, Lund University. And um, the title is uh, Spectral Analysis of Took. So as you, as we can all already guess here, it consists of, uh, of two parts, uh, the analysis of Took and spectral analysis tools. So Took is a, it is an important cipher that is uh, nowadays used in uh, mobile network uh, communication. So the 128-bit key version was adopted in 2011 by 3GPP. And then recently we have seen a new version of Took uh, which can accept a 256-bit key. So basically the key stream generator is as shown on the picture. It has, uh, an LFSR, which operates in modular two to the power 31 minus one. And we have the fine state machine down there, which operates in GF uh, two to the power 32. And it's a bit of mixing fields uh, operations here. And that makes it a bit difficult to, to analyze uh, this uh, cipher. Until uh, now, there, there is no attack that is faster than two to the power of 256, so faster than exhaustive key search. 
And um, so in this work, we found uh, an academic attack that is uh, two to the power 20 times faster than exhaustive key search. If it is not, of course, it is not an immediate threat in 5G settings, but uh, sort of the first result. So it's a, it's in a linear distinguishing attack, and basically uh, here 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 are the results. Uh, so we found a way how to do the sampling from the key stream, and um, uh, so that sampling will be equal to the total noise, so the expression of which is given on the next on the second bullet. So there, there in the sampling and in the noise expression, the attacker can choose the matrix M, which is 32 times 32 binary metrics. And uh, of course, the choice of that matrix um, actually results in, in, the, in how large the bias of the noise will be. So we found uh, a good one uh, that gives us a distinguishing attack of complexity 2 to the power 236. So basically, the main problem in our analysis was how to find a good matrix M and how to, to do a good uh, linear masking and uh, S-box approximations uh, such that gives us a large bias. And here we come to the second part of our work, the spectral tools. We found a very, very interesting approach such that, uh, okay, we assume we have a noise distribution and um, uh, let's have a look in the spectrum in the in the frequency domain of uh, of that uh, noise distribution and basically uh, we found that um, we can see here on the right side of this picture that the the noise or the the bias of the noise is basically the sum of those uh, red boxes over here but each of each term here should be taken into the square into the power of two. And uh, so that uh, the consequence here is that actually, if we, if we want to compute uh, some biases or if you want to operate with multidimensional noise distributions, so it is very, very good to, to do it in the, in, the, in the frequency domain. Because there we don't have uh, the precision problem. We don't need to have a uh, large number um, uh, arithmetic in that case. So we, we can solve the, the, the precision problem. We can also compute the bias, compute, we can also compute the bias in the frequency domain. Also in the frequency domain, we can do the convolution of the noises. So, but th this result is sort of known, but uh, it's very important to have a look that when we do the convolution of noises, then basically it is pointwise multiplication of those red boxes. Uh, so, so actually, this inspired us to think about how we can, uh, if, we, if we can apply a mask or linear masking, then how can we, um, uh, what kind of linear masking we can choose such that in the frequency domain, one noise uh, will be, the spectrum of one of the noises will be shuffled or rotated in a special way such that the the, the largest uh, red boxes here will actually coincide. So they will match each other su such that the product will be maximized. And that would give us a very large uh, bias in the end. So we started to study uh, different things in, in, the, in how we can manipulate the spectrum of the noises. And we found some uh, interesting approaches. Uh, for example, linear masking, we found uh, some Ferrum 2, or, and Ferrum 6, how we can do it in walsh Hadamard domain and in, uh, in a fast Fourier domain. And th that resulted in uh, two different algorithms, how we can find those uh, matrices uh, that will maximize or give us a fairly large noise in the end, in the sum. Uh, also, we started to, see, to look at um, uh, S-box approximations as well. So for example, we have seen different as box uh, constructions. For example, in Snow 3G, um, the, there are 32 bit as boxes, uh, which are constructed such that we first apply smaller as boxes or 8 bit as boxes, and then we apply a linear masking. Uh, and in Tsuk, for example, it's another way around. We first apply a 32 bit linear masking and then 
parallel smaller S boxes. So in the general approximation then would be that the noise X is like a, a linear operation, a linear transformation R times the parallel S boxes S and then another linear transformation Q times the input X. And that is normally um, approximated as some um, matrix M times input X and that will constitute the noise. Uh, so, so it would be interesting to see then uh, how to find the, the approximation uh, matrix uh, such that the, the, the resulting noise would have a large bias. And we found uh, very interesting results there how we can do it for small S boxes like 8 bit S boxes, uh, how to find such matrices. We also and then we also started to, to see how we can do it for composite S-boxes, uh, such as those examples above, and found the way how we can uh, probe uh, the spectrum of a, of a composite, uh, of an approximation of a composite S-box in the frequency domain uh, without even having to construct the distribution table of such an approximation at all. So. I think it's it's a, it's an interesting approach. For example, if you look on block ciphers, they they are basically large S boxes, large composite S boxes. So maybe maybe it is possible to use uh, similar tools for for analysis of block ciphers as well. So that's basically our work. And um, uh, thank you very much. I encourage everyone just to have a look on the full video and maybe to read uh, our paper. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So please ask your question in the Zulip chat. So we now move on to two talks on cube attacks and the division property. The first one is on the links between the, sorry, sorry. The first one is entitled Revisit Division Property Based Cube Attacks, Key Recovery or Distinguishing Attacks. And Chen Dongye will give the talk. Chen Dong, can you share your screen? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Can you? Oh. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, not we very well. You. Yeah. <laughs> but the sound, but the volume is very low, it seems. Is this better? No, I don't think so. Can I make it full screen? Yes, it's better now. Is it yeah, it's better. better now? I think it's better. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it, it is glad to present our work here. We mainly revisit the division property based cube attacks. Cube attacks were first proposed by Dina and Shami at EuroCrypto 2009, which is one of the most powerful attacks against NFSR based string ciphers. For a string cipher, the output bit could be represented as a trickable polynomial f on key variables and iv variables. For a set of a set of IV variables f could be written as the following form. In cube attacks, the variables in I are called cube variables, the remaining IV variables are called non-cube variables, and the linear space stand by the cube variables is called a cube, and the polynomial Pi is called a superpoly of I in F. Originally, linearity tests are applied to find the linear superpolys in cube attacks. However, the computing complexity increases exponentially as the size of the cube set increases. Generally, the size is confined to 40. 40. At crypto 2017, Toto and some other researchers made a breakthrough by applying division property to cube attacks. The main idea is using division property to analyze the algebraic normal form of the output bit, hence, Cubes with large sizes could be used. In division property, in division property based cube attacks, for a given cube, I, a set of J, which contains all the key variables appearing in the superpoly, could be figured out. However, 
the bit best division property could not analyze the ANF of the output bit precisely, since, since it does not consider the terms furnished by the XOR operation. For a cube set I, even though the set J is not empty, the superpoly PI may be constant. To keep the validity of key recovery attacks, there was an important assumption, which is called a weak key assumption. The main idea of a weak key assumption is that for a given cube I, there were many values of non-cube variables, such that the corresponding superpoly is not a constant function. Based on this assumption, for a cube set I, when the corresponding set J is not empty, key recovery attacks could be established. However, weak key assumption, weak assumption does not always hold. It indicates that some so-called key recovery attacks may be distinguished attacks only. Based on the buff motivation, we release the division property based cube attacks and propose a new method which is able to recover the superpoly of I in the output bit. Our main idea is expressing the output bit as a polynomial on the initial internal state iteratively and discard the terms where the superpoly of I is zero constant in each iteration. Following our main idea, we propose a new useful lemma which could judge whether the superpoly of I in a term U is zero constant. With, with this lemma, we could obtain a reduced polynomial in each iteration. As a result, our main idea could be summarized into the following steps. As illustrations, we apply our method to run the reduced Trivium. Trivium is a bit oriented stream cipher, which is one of the final lists of E stream. With our new method, with our new method for the cube used to attack 832 round Trivium, we recover the exact ANF of its super poly, which is given by equation one. Based on this exact superpoly, we could obtain two different uh, equations under two different assignments of non cube variables. And so we could uh, recover more than one bit information of the sec security key. Furthermore, for the cubes proposed at the crypto 2018, we, pro we prove that the, their superpolys are all zero constant, hence the key recovery attacks are uh, all distinguished attacks, uh, in fact. Uh, that's all our works. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we now have a second talk on cube attacks. So the talk is given by Yongli Hao. And so as the title of the talk is links between division property and over cube attack variants. Yongli? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is fine. You can start. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce our paper entitled Links Between Division Property and Other Cube Attack Variants. Uh, as we all know, a theoretically reliable key recovery result should include two proofs. Proof one, there should be non randomness for correct key guess. And proof two, there should be randomness provable for wrong key guesses. Proof one has always been the central concern, but taking proof two for granted can also cause catastrophic consequences, such as Fu et al. self-contradicted results on Trivium, which have been proved wrong in Eurocrypt 2020. The previous dynamic cube attack on Fu Grun 128 was given by Diner et al. at uh, 2011. They used the non-randomness called bias phenomenon. In proof one, they, they thought the bias phenomenon is occur for the correct key guess. And for proof two, they simply assume that the cube summation are random zero or ones for wrong key guesses. But according to their experiments, bias phenomenon is only detected for eight out of 107 tests. And for proof two, they have never tested at all. So 
their success probability can be no higher than 7.5%. Therefore, we are trying to give a theoretically more reliable dynamic cube attack on Grand 128 with a success probability much higher than 7.5%. In our proof one, we use the zero-sum property for 29 cubes when the key guess is correct. For proof two, we only restrict that not all 29 cube summations are zero. We also prove that the proof two is true with probability of 99.83%. The technique we use is the division property, along with the degree evaluation algorithm and the flag technique. In dynamic cube attack, uh, if if a, a particular intermediate state bit Sij is nullified by the by setting the VL into its dynamic value FL, then the superpoly of the output bit may have some non-randomness called bias, which means that the superpoly PI equals to zero with higher probability. Therefore, in the offline phase, one only needs to collect highly qualified cubes having significant bias. Then in the online phase, we we'll have to guess the key bits related to the dynamic value FL uh, to compute and the compute and compute the cube summations corresponding to the qualified cubes. Then the correct key guess should be the one having the most zero summations. In our attack, the intermediate state to be nullified is the B158 bit. Hmm. And in order to nullify such an intermediate state bit, three key bits have to be guessed. If the key guesses are correct, key guesses are correct, which means W equals to zero, we have the intermediate state bit B158 equals to zero. And for the wrong guesses, such as W equals to one to seven, the B158 have complicated is a complicated polynomial. And such a difference in the key guess should be reflected by the, should be reflected by the different, different property based uh, MIRP model M. For the correct key guess, uh, and such a difference can be reflected by the flag value of the B one fifty eight bit. For the correct key guess, we have B one fifty eight equals to zero, zero. And for the B, for the wrong guess, we use W equals to one as a representation. We have B one fifty eight equals to one. Then, with such model, we run the degree evaluation algorithm and acquire the degree evaluations DO and D1 corresponding to the correct and incorrect key guesses. For proof, for in order to have our proof one, we restrict that DO equals to minus one to guarantee the zero sum property. For proof two, we restrict that the D1 must be much larger than zero so that the corresponding super poly is likely to be a high degree polynomial. In Dinar's attack, when they, uh, when they evaluate their success probability, they simply assume that for the wrong guess, the super polys corresponding to the wrong guess are random for all keys. But according to our analysis, we, we are able to find a weak key class W, which means that for the, for the, key business, for the keys in the W, the corresponding super poly is constantly, constantly zero. Therefore, we can only assume the randomness for the non-weak keys. Such a weak key class W is determined by a specific structure called split set. Such as, and the split set with, with the knowledge of such a split set, the bias of corresponding to the wrong key guess can be evaluated as follows. The smaller split set is, the larger the bias is. Therefore, the success probability of our attack should be re-evaluated, re and the criteria for the qualified cube should be modified as well. In addition to restricting D1 much larger than zero, we should also restrict that the, the corresponding minimum split sets are of size larger than two. With such a restriction, the success probability of our attack should be re-evaluated re as 99.83%. Such a technique has also have other applications. For example, if we use the largest possible cube I along with the largest possible split set lambda, we may give the secure bound for green light stream ciphers against the biased cube testers. We can also determine whether a key bit xj really appear in the linear part of the superpoly to improve the attacks on Crivium and Acorn. 
And to sum up, what we have done have broadened the application of the division property technique. We have employed the division, division property to the realm of dynamic Cubitec to explain the bias phenomenon and improve the success probability. And that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we now move on to uh, some papers on uh, cryptanalysis of two stream ciphers. So the first one is the cryptanalysis of Plantlet, and the presentation is given by uh, Hashaya Barouti. Hashaya, you can share your screen. Yes, sure. One second. Okay. So That's is fine. it good now? You can start. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Khashayar from EPFL, and today I'm here to present our paper called Cryptanalysis of Plantlets with Suba Dipanik and Takano Rizola. So let's start with by saying what Plantlet is. So Plantlet is a stream cipher which was proposed in ICR TOSC 2017 by Arnecht and Mikelev. So you might know the same people from Sprout, which was the predecessor of Plantlet. So Plantlet has a grain-like structure, meaning that the internal state is one NFSR and one LFSR. In this case, 40 bits for the NFSR and 61 bits for the LFSR. It has a 80-bit long secret key, and you need to run 320 initialization rounds before generating key stream bits. And uh, an important thing about Plantlet is that you cannot generate more than two to the power 30 key stream bits with, a, with the same key and ID. So now let's talk about our attacks. We use two main tools. So first one is like for any LFSR, I would say. So imagine that you have delta, which is the difference of the LFSR values at times T1 and T2. And you also have the difference at the, between the two times T1 and T2. So by solving this equation, where A is the update matrix of the LFSR, you can recover what the value of the LFSR at time T1 and T2 actually is. So to sum it up, basically knowing the difference between the LFSR values and difference between the times, one can recover what the LFSR values actually are. So uh, this is actually the main observation that we made that's helped us come up with the attack. So imagine that you have two times T1 and T2, which are both equal, like two cycles, which are both equal modulo 80. And then the states at these two times, the internal states only differ on the 43rd bit of the LFSR. If you have this property in the internal state, then the output stream, uh, uh, the key stream bits that you would get at these times at T1 and T2 would have a, a fixed difference on 45 bits. So we can find 45 difference bits, like depending on this times T1 and T2, that would be either zero or one bit probability one. And also eight, uh, we can find eight other bits which only depend on the LFSR values. So uh, after this, we use this fact, uh, like this observation to like narrow down the search space that we need for uh, the internal states and try to do a key recovery on Plantlet. So let's talk about our attack. Let's, uh, so what we're doing. So as I said, if you have the 43rd difference here in the internal state, only on the LFSR, then we have a 45 bit pattern, 45 positions that have a specific difference at times for times T1 and T2 in the output stream bits. But having this 45 bit pattern does not necessarily mean that we have the desired difference in the internal states. But what we will do is that we will collect a lot of pairs such that satisfy this pattern here. And for each time we will assume that the difference in the internal state is only on the 43rd bit, 43rd bit of the LFSR. And uh, we will solve an equation system. And if our assumption was correct, then we would get the key. So what are we doing exactly? We're first generating a lot of key stream bits for different IVs. We're keeping all the pairs of T1 and T2 such that the key, key stream bits at these times have that uh, satisfying pattern that we wanted, that satisfy the pattern that we wanted, that's 45 position. 
And then after seeing this pattern, we just assume that the difference in the, between the states are only on the 43rd bit of the LFSR. And having this, based on the first thing that we talked about, we know the difference between the two states, the LFSR, and we know the time difference. So we can recover what the values of the LFSR exactly is, if our assumption is correct, again. And then using this, we use those other eight bits of the difference that we know only dependent on the LFSR to do more filtering. After doing this, using the uh, equation to generate the, uh, the function that generates the keystring bits, we come up with a equation system with unknowns, which are the NFSR bits and the key bits. And th then we feed this to a SAT solver and see if we can recover the key or not. So let's talk about the complexity. We need to generate two to the power 30, as I said, this was the limit key stream bits for this many different IV values, two to the power 48.28. And then between the number of pairs that we would get that would satisfy all the conditions would be two to the power 48.54. So we need to solve this many equation systems. So we ran some experiments to see how long the SAT solver takes to uh, give us the solution or to abort if there is no solution. And it takes two to the power 17.5 encryption times to give us a solution and two to the power 17.13 encryption times to abort if there is no solution. So it would abort basically when the assumption that we made that the difference in the state is only on the 43rd bit of the LFSR was not true. So the total complexity of uh, key stream generation is two to the power 69.98. And the total complexity of solving the equations would be two to the power 59.38. So let's wrap it up. So we presented an attack on the full version of planted stream cipher and in which the complexity is heavily dominated by the key stream generation phase, which is, so the total complexity would be two to the power 69.98 template encryption. And the main tool that we used was that if we have this difference in the internal state, then 45 bits of the output key stream differences would be fixed. So thank you very much for listening and I would be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please continue asking your question in the chat. I think we have only one question at the moment, so please. And uh, so we now have the last presentation of this session. It's on ages. The presentation is given by Marcel Nagler, and the paper is entitled Analyzing the Linear P-Stream Biases in Ages. Marcel? Thank you for fine. the introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me all. All right, yes, uh, so fine. you can stop. OK, uh, thanks. So today we will be talking of, about Aegis, a uh, family of authenticated encryption schemes designed by Hong Chun Wu and Bart Brenel. And it, they are mainly relevant because the, the variant Aegis 128 was part of the final portfolio in the CESAR competition. And it also has two different members, Aegis 256 and Aegis 128L. Here on the right, you can see um, the structure of each is 128. So it has a huge uh, internal state. Each of these substate is 16 bytes in size. And then uh, to generate 16 bytes of key stream, the substates are combined using a Boolean function. And afterwards, the state is updated by applying one round of AES to each substate and XLRing it onto the neighboring round. And previously, each has been analyzed by Pris Minot, who found a linear keystream distinguisher by hand for each is 128 and each is 256. And as you can see, for each is 128, this leads to an attack with high complexity, so higher than 2 to 128. But for each is 256, this, this led to a distinguishing attack with better complexity than a generic attack. And in the meantime, a similar cipher, Morus, which has a similar mode, but a different state update function was analyzed in 2018 by a team of researchers. They also found a keystream distinguisher by hand with quite high complexity. But about a year later, um, a different team applied mixed integer linear programming to substantially improve the complexity. So as you can see, it, the complexity was about two to the 76 for a distinguishing attack, which is a huge improvement. And the main question we want to answer in this paper is whether we can apply 
similar techniques to the Aegis family of ciphers and whether we can find some bounds for the squared correlation contribution of linear approximations. So for our results, um, first you can see the results of Pries Minot and we propose three different mixed integer linear programming models. We start with a simple one that follows the basic, uh, the basic constraints for AES like ciphers. And you ca we can see that we are able to derive some bounds, but we are unable to find matching bitwise characteristics. To fix, to fix that, we propose the improved model that identifies the inconsistencies in the truncated model and adds some more constraints. And using that model, we are able to find uh, keystream approximations for each is 128 with a better squared correlation contribution than previously known. And finally, to close the bound, uh, to close the gap between the best bound and the best uh, keystream uh, approximations, we propose the bitwise model, which is able to um, specify the, the bitwise behavior of mixed columns, the end gates, and the branches. And as a quick as a quick note, I would like to show the idea behind the improved model as, it, as I think it's the most interesting one. Uh, so here you can see the, the result from the tr truncated model and we highlighted two inconsistencies in, in this uh, output. So one would be he uh, here and here. And the main idea we have is taking a look at the mixed columns operations. So if you take a look at this mixed columns operation and this mixed columns operation, the patterns are valid on their own. But uh, if we f if we take a look at the differences between the between the masks, uh, we can find a different difference for the output masks. And using that different difference, we are able uh, using that different expression for the difference, we are able to argue our inconsistencies and provide the improved model, which uh, allows us to find an attack using a byte level model. So to conclude, uh, we proposed improved keystream approximations for all members of the Aegis family. And we also have shown upper bounds for the squared correlation contribution below two to the minus 128. We note that straightforward models only produce very weak bounds and do not provide any solutions. And if you're interested, I invite you to read the code that is linked here and also watch the full talk and read the paper. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks to all the speakers. So I now let Christoph and CY start with the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now is the time for questions. Uh, so let me check the questions and see if I can read out loud. Um, the first question is by uh, Jan for Chendong about the weak assumption property for cubes. Um, are there known criteria that make a cube satisfy the weak assumption? Other than just checking the definition for a given cube, are there certain large classes of non-trivial cubes that satisfy this weak assumption? OK, that's a good question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, as, as far as we know, there is no known criteria that makes the cube satisfy the weak assumption. I think uh, there are a large class of cubes that satisfy this weak assumption, but uh, there is no uh, criteria to judge whether a cube satisfies this weak, weak assumption. Okay, then, uh, thanks for the answer. Um, then let me ask uh, the second question that we have. Uh, that's a question to uh, Kasha Ya by uh, Jan Rutella. If having difference uh, does not mean you necessarily have the pattern in the internal state, I assume you have a probability arriving here. Do you know it? More precisely, can the data complexity be lower or the data complexity is exactly computed from the exact probability to have the pattern you are looking for? Okay, so the, this is a good question. So if you watch the, the full-length talk or look at the paper, we exactly like computed the probability 
that we have kind of a collision between two states, two internal states, such that they only differ in the 43rd bit of the LFSR. And we computed how many IVs do we need to reach here. And then having that number of IVs, how many pairs would pass to have that number of equations. So I think the probability is like quite precisely computed. Okay, uh, thanks for this answer. Um, then we have a question from Gaëtan to Marcel. Um, did you ever look at linear house? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, for the for the bounds we have proven, we cannot really uh, instruct the MIRP solver to to look at linear house. At least I don't know of any ways to do that. But for the concrete approximations we have found, uh, we in particular verified them experimentally, and we found a linear Heil effect between the consecutive AND and S boxes, which I explain a bit in the full version of the talk. And it has a small impact on the bound, I think. But okay, it's not so, too stark, so. OK, so you could expect it to, to have a, a positive linear Heil effect uh, with respect to, the, to, to, to an attack. Yeah, and also, um, if the masks are, uh, if you evaluate the mask separately, between the S box and the end gate, it might even have, uh, you might expect it to have non zero correlation where it actually has zero co correlation. Uh, we have an example for that in the, uh, I have an example for that in the full version and in the paper. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, now, maybe a question from uh, myself um, <laughs> regarding the first presentation of uh, Snow 5. Um, I was wondering, uh, there, there were uh, comparisons uh, of Snow uh, 5 uh, regarding speed um, with different ciphers like um, ChaCha or ES. And I was wondering, there are several ciphers um, published which also make use of the ES construction, like we've seen in the last talk, uh, EGIS, or uh, what else comes to my mind is um, Simpira or Haraka. Um, did you have a look at this cipher uh, and do you know how they compare versus uh, Snow 5? Okay, so, um, so thanks for the question. No, um, we didn't look at those ciphers. We, what we did for the um, but, but the speed comparison the was to please. sorry. Oh, that's good. Okay, I don't have such a bad. Um... Is this better? If it's not better, maybe you can answer the question, Sasha. <laughs> well, this is of course better, but now you are far away. This is of course better, but now you are far away. Okay, but uh, so we didn't we didn't look at, at those uh, ciphers. We we took the best um, assembly implementations that we can find in OpenSSL uh, and and okay. uh, did a comparison to those algorithms. Okay, okay. Thanks for the question. Okay. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, no, thanks for the answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, I think thanks for the question actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, maybe uh, see why I can take over a bit. Okay, so a question to Hasaya: Is there a building block that could be changed in order to make pla plantlet resistant to your attack? More generally, do you think that it is possible to design a secure stream cipher? with an internal state smaller than twice the key length? And this question is from Anne. Well, this is a really good question, actually, and something that we actually looked on like after we came up with the paper. So one idea was that instead of having the LFSR, so the fact that that's, we have one linear shift register makes it easy to recover it only knowing the difference. So we thought like, can we have like two shift, two nonlinear shift registers such that again, we would have like the full cycle like plant that does. And uh, we looked into like there are a bunch of sequences called De Bruyne sequences, I guess, which, uh, the, uh, which we know for sure that they would have like the full length 
uh, cycle that we want. So we looked, looked into it, but unfortunately we couldn't find anything for now at least, but it's still something that we're looking into it. So I cannot give like an exact solution, an exact answer for this, but I remember the, we had a problem of making this. So at least it's not something super easy. Like we cannot like patch it in an easy way to say that, okay, it would stop the attack. Okay, so you think that there is a hope to, 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 to build, to design such a, a stream cipher with a small state? Uh, to, to be honest, I'm not sure because it's something that we spend some time on it. And at least there is no generic solution for it, I would say. Like more theory should be developed. Okay, thanks a lot. No problem. Thanks for okay, the uh, question. Yeah. So I think I missed some questions from Gaitung to Marcel. Did you look at linear hoss? Yeah, I already answered that question answered before. This, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, no problem. Okay. So a question from Alexei. A question to Chen Dong. Do you think that for a cube with constant zero super poly, there there lack exists a smaller cube with non-constant super poly, leading to even better key recovery. Alternatively, that for the same cube variables, there exists non-constant super poly at a later round, again leading to even better key recovery. Chen Dong, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. I can hear you. I can hear you. I think uh, I think this both this both of these two cases may happen. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my answer is that both of these two cases may may happen. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, my, my my answer to this question is that. Uh, both of these two cases may happen. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I have a question to Alexander. Uh, can you apply the spectral technique to other primitives like AES to, for example, analyze the S box? Uh, th thank you for the question, uh, for the question, Siwe. And um, actually, I'm very pleased to see you virtually, at least. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes. So I think um, I think it's in general very very interesting idea to to look at the spectrum of uh, of uh, noise variables and approximations. And uh, as I already said, that approximation of a composite S box can also be done in some way in the spectrum domain. And uh, a block cipher like IS, it is a large uh, block, uh, it is a large composite as box basically. So we, I don't know for sure, but I believe uh, it might be so that we can also apply um, uh, spect spectral techniques to analyze uh, IS kind of ciphers as well. But I have to look at this, uh, so I don't really know if it's possible or not, but I believe it should be in some way helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do I miss some questions? Maybe uh, I have a question to Yongli uh, uh, yeah, on, uh, on, the, okay. uh, on the bias in the wrong key case, uh, because uh, as as far as I understand, uh, what you are doing is that you are using an assumption which states that uh, in some cases the, the bias will be small when the superpoly has a small split set, right? Do, do my question is: Do you have any evidence or any argument for for this assumption? Uh, yes, in our paper we have done some experiments on the low, on a shorter, shorter round of uh, grain one twenty eight, and uh, we are able to find that when the when the minimum split sets are 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 small and the bias can be larger than those with 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 large with larger 
then uh, when the when the split set uh, when the minimum split sets are large, uh, the the bias are usually smaller, and that's what we have found on green one twenty eight. Mm. Okay, so you didn't find any counterexample on that of that. Uh, yes, yes, because the because the minimum split sets are usually very small. Mm, the the minimum split sets are either of one or two or three. And that's that's enough for for green one twenty eight. So uh, we, we can easily exhaust all possible combinations on to make a uh, split set. So we we we, we can. We, there is a there, you know, we, we have observed such a, such a such a phenomenon. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, sorry, I think I missed the question from Itai. Yeah, so question to Yunlin regarding your proof that uh, green twelve eight resists dynamic cube attacks after a certain number of rounds. If I understand correctly, you prove that the specific division based analysis method you are using cannot detect the bias. Proving this in general requires proving a lower bound on the degree of the output polynomial. However, it seems to me that you cannot prove a lower bound on the degree of the polynomial using this method without making any assumption or calculating the high degree monomials ex explicitly. Can you elaborate on this, Yunlin? Uh, yes, mm, I, I I saw this this question mm, online, uh, and I answered him mm, privately uh, just now. <coughs> and it, it was uh, I wasn't I was uh, I was uh, I have to apologize that I made a mistake in my in PPT because uh, the I was the secure bounds were not for the dynamic cube attack but for the bias based cube tester and uh, the. The secure uh, our, the division property method shows that after several rounds, uh, every key bit uh, have the possibility of um, uh, are have become likely to appear in the linear part of the super poly corresponding to the largest possible cube. In this case, it is unlikely for the cube summation to show any bias phenomenon either to zero or to one. Therefore, uh, therefore, this is uh, this is this is not the question of whether it is a lower bound or an upper bound. It's, it's, it simply means that the 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 key bits are appearing in the linear linear part of the super poly, and that, that that's what means for the bounds. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> yeah, I think I have a last question to Marcel. Uh, do you take into consideration the correlation between different rounds in your model? Um, I'm s sorry, I do not understand the yeah, I question. mean, for example, for different rounds, we assume they are independent in our models, in our uh, mixed integer programming models. Uh, so do you take into account this dependencies um so we are assuming that two state update function calls are independent if you if that's what you mean so we assume that first yeah. of all we have a, a random state before we begin and okay, that the x are from the left hand side for example also the random uh, randomizes the state again so we evaluate those probabilities independently yeah, I see. Thank you very much. So Do we I'm, have any other question? Um, maybe, maybe I have a, a last one for the session um, towards uh, Ying um, and the attack on Snow 3G. Um, yeah. I've, I've read the paper and uh, it seems that you really uh, dive deep into Snow 3G with, with your attack and uh, usually uh, if you um, write down so uh, such an attack. You also might have an idea how to how how a, a little tweak could prevent those attack. Do do you have any such an idea? A except uh, tweaking to to get to Snow Five, of course. You mean how we had the idea to? No, what 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 uh, could you make an easy change in Snow Three G uh, to prevent your attack? <laughs> 
in in the in the FSR, like uh, doing a rotation somewhere, uh, usually <laughs> often helps. <laughs> a little bit difficult to answer. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know, <laughs> I, I have no idea of this uh, question. I don't know how to uh, change it or modify it to to make it uh, can provide the 256 bit security. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then. Can I, can I maybe add? Is, yeah. is, it, is it okay if I add a bit more? Yeah, yes, of, of course. course. Is it okay? Uh, well, I think the reason why the attack on Snow 3G worked is because of we looked at the three consecutive key stream words, which each of which is like 32 bytes. So we took only the first byte of, of it. Well, one of the words was rotated in some special way. So I think that the the, the simple uh, prevention of this attack. I mean, I mean, wh why why we got the bias is because the depending the dependent uh, bytes from this the, from the FSM, they were all they were well aligned into this the first byte mm -hmm. actually, so we could skip the other ones. <laughs> uh, I think a better rotation somewhere like sigma rotation in Snow V or something like this could scramble it better those dependencies through m many more bytes. You know, um, not concrete example, but uh, the feeling is like this. Okay, thanks for the answer. And uh, I guess we, we are uh, well in time to end this session. Uh, yes, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to thank, of course, all the moderators, uh, the speakers, and of course, the, the audience of, uh, of uh, today for, uh, for a very nice, uh, um, for making the a very nice uh, and interesting uh, uh, technical presentations and uh, discussions. And um, I would like to 